And I want to ask the first question that is, what aspects of Mandarin Chinese do you think are most challenging to teach online? Um, and then just kind of going along with our group, I'm going to go ahead and start off by passing that over to Wang Laoshi, if you want to go ahead and start us off, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, that is a very good question. Um, so I think the to practice to make a conversation in a context and in a cultural appropriate manner is pretty challenging for students to learn Mandarin Chinese online. Uh, as you know, in a face-to-face -face lesson, you can use body languages. Uh, you can demonstrate. Uh, how to you know uh, hold a conversation in a cultural context. Um, you can also act it out in person. You can walk around in the classroom, but in an online class, um, it is kind of limited by the space of the computer screen, your tablet, uh, your phone screen, even the Wi-Fi speed may affect. So the limitation of the device and technology itself may reduce the effectiveness of the lessons. So I think that put you know a challenge to students to, to grasp that some of the you know the uh, the culture uh, part of you know the language uh, when you when you do teach online versus the teaching in the classroom. I would definitely agree with that. There is that kind of artifact that you're dealing with. You're actually having to have students go through another medium on top of that. So that is a really good point. Can you share any stories or anything in particular where you've been able to help students who maybe are really struggling with that aspect overcome it? Um, well, that, that's a that's a good, a very good follow up question. Um, uh, there's uh, when I do the online and I try to create a little bit kind of uh, um, context. For example, when I teach the beginning level class and uh, there's a lot of vocabulary related with food, um, ordering food, um, I think I would try to envision that, you know, your um, students are at home, they are have easy access to our kitchen, to their, you know, uh, fridge. So I would, you know, have a very mini task for when they learn the vocabulary and have, have a discussion and say, hey, can you find something you like, you enjoy eating, and then just grab five items. And then, okay, let's do in pairs. And so can you create a small kind of conversation and you can use, you know, kind of move, over, you know, your cameras, you know, having the face, you know, to, a, you know, maybe your kitchen and show us what you make for lunch or dinner. So that creates a little bit kind of those contacts that is quite authentic. And then they can apply, you know, like the new word they learn, the expressions, but they can also, you know, practice in a more, more meaningful way. And that's kind of like a compensation on that, you know, without, you know, a real human, you know, interactions, you know, in person. Definitely. And also a great way to build those connections, actually talking about what are you doing? How are you, what are you working on? How are you, what are you eating for lunch today? Again, building those connections in that online environment. So fantastic. And that's very creative. That's something to think about. Definitely. I appreciate that. Fantastic. I'll pass the next, well, the same question. I'll just pass the same question and I'll go to uh, Peng Laoshi. And the question again was, what aspects of Mandarin Chinese do you think are most challenging to teach online? So this is a great question. And I also agree with uh, Wang Laoshi on some of the aspects she mentioned. Um, it depends how we approach this question pedagogically, if you're talking about pronunciation, right, the speaking part, the um, interaction with students to um, maintain the conversation in class. So that's, uh, I think if we start with uh, freshmen or the, the novice students, the pronunciation is the first challenge, how to, to uh, practice uh, pronunciation when we are not uh, in the face to, traditional face-to-face -face, uh, manner. And another challenge may be how to keep the target use of uh, uh, the, the use of target language uh, over 90% uh, throughout the class. So that's another challenge. Um, and another challenge may have to do with literacy skills like reading characters and writing characters, practicing them and um, uh, typing them even um, pick uh, selecting the right characters. So that's from the pedagogical side. But these days I'm thinking more from the student experience uh, perspective. How do you uh, maintain students' interest uh, and make sure that the time management uh, in the classroom is, um, is effective? 
so that uh, you, at, while you are uh, trying to uh, engage students uh, in individualized learning uh, and provide um, feedback, uh, immediate or uh, constructive feedback to uh, maintain their interest. So they will keep coming back to continue the, their uh, Chinese learning uh, process. Um, in terms of the solution, uh, I think uh, there are two things I did in the past uh, couple of years. One is to have students um, build, building the uh, frequent and early success uh, experiences for students. So after, uh, after to fill, flip the class, uh, after they watch the videos, still have um, some of our tutors and assistants or sometimes language partners from China or from Taiwan uh, to engage students in 10 or 15 minutes um, comprehension checks every week. I think that's very helpful. Uh, another one is to still engage students in cultural pro uh, projects. So for example, how to uh, make your uh, tomato uh, and the egg dish, how to make boba tea, how to, um, how to just bringing the cultural elements in the classroom. So these are my um, ideas. Thank you. Excellent. Those are really good points and especially kind of digging a little bit deeper into what you brought up about pronunciation. And I can imagine, I personally, I'm not a, a teacher of Mandarin Chinese. I did try to very briefly tried to learn a few things and the learning how to speak in tones was extremely challenging for me, even though I had a lot of background with other languages. And in an online environment too, especially, I would think that would be really challenging. Are there any particular ways and means that you deal with struggles with tone and pronunciation whenever you're in that online environment? It depends on the student's uh, learning style. Some students are really analytical, so if you show them the visual of the, the, their pitch and the sound, record them and show them, okay, so this is the ideal situation. This is how native speakers pronounce, and this is your pronunciation. So it works for some students, but it doesn't work for other students. Other students don't need to know explicitly uh, which part I made a mistake. Uh, what they want is to uh, create some stories or to have them uh, come up with mnemonics, how to pronounce the, the, the pronunciation. Again, I think even at the very stage of, uh, beginning stage of learning pronunciation, stories and student interest, their inputs, their perspective really helps. Definitely. And it is very helpful to have that differentiated instruction. As we know very well as online educators, it's not one size fits all. Some students are going to need some different things. So I love having different approaches for different students. I definitely think that's very helpful. And it's a very unique way to address that particular nuance of learning Mandarin Chinese as tone is so important. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. And then again, passing the next question, this time we'll go to Waltz Laoshi. And again, the question was, what aspects of Mandarin Chinese do you think are most challenging to teach online? Well, I would love to jump on our last answer and say boba tea because it's my favorite, but I'm not going to do that. Um, actually, what I find to be the most challenging to teach online is reading. And that's kind of a, a technical issue, I think, because... Um, the biggest problem for me is getting enough text that's available. To preface this, I am a straight 100% CI teacher, comprehended input, uh, also sometimes called acquisition driven instruction these days. I can't keep up with the acronyms. But basically, if, if you haven't heard of that, what it is in my five second elevator speech is I'm flooding my students with Mandarin that they can understand from the first day. So part of that flood is text. But the problem is that it's really hard to find a large volume of text for novice level or even intermediate level learners, really. When you're still below, say, 200 character level, really hard to find interesting things, uh, let alone things that are at the paragraph level and which are long. Um, and by long, we, for unit one, we have students reading over 8,000 characters of running text. So it's significantly longer than what we traditionally would think of as a yuetuduanwen, a, a brief reading passage in a book. Uh, so that's my biggest thing. Um, the other side of that 
and I probably didn't think of this before I started writing books, but now I do, is copyright. Because if I buy a copy of a book, maybe it's a fantastic book, but does buying that copy give me the legal right to display it through an electronic means? I don't know. You know I'm really not a copyright lawyer, but it's something to think about um, because educational fair use only goes so far. So that's the biggest thing. And as far as pedagogy and reading, the biggest challenge for me is the one-on-one -on -one comprehension checks. I want to know that every one of my students is reading and comprehending every word of this text exactly the way the meaning should be. But it's difficult if you've got a group of people online and you break out rooms only go so far. And it's, it's a challenge. It's an ongoing challenge that I'm trying to solve, but I can't say I've come to any, you know, 100% solutions yet. Maybe next year. <laughs> I can definitely relate to the feeling of not having found the perfect solution just yet. And that's kind of part of the craft of educating others because it's, trying to tinker with what works and this might work great for this group but for the other group it didn't work at all but do you have anything in particular you want to share with us you'd mentioned breakout rooms but maybe some strategies that you are working with and exploring now to try to meet those challenges of getting that one-on-one -on -one comprehension check-in well basically I keep my groups small I have the luxury of doing that because I teach privately um, when I taught in in public schools which I did at levels from middle school high school college um, and adults too. The strategy for that is to basically differentiate your reading by giving them different reading tasks. You're going to know within a couple of readings who is a quicker reader and who's a slower reader, just to say. I don't want to say better achiever is worse. It's just people acquire at different paces. So I'm going to take my better readers, quote unquote, and maybe give them an independent reading task. Maybe I'll say to them, read this passage, the same thing, to each other, or use some of the reading games that we have set up. Meanwhile, that frees me to be able to work one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with the people who are having more difficulty. And that works online as well. You, know, you can do it with breakout rooms. The question is, how do you get everyone on task without spending 20 minutes figuring out who gets what resources and like that? But yeah, that's basically it, is to try to get a model going where everyone has something useful and meaningful to do, but it frees up the teacher's attention to deal with students who need a little more support. Excellent. And absolutely. Having that one-on-one -on -one -on -one kind of the pair work, I find is also very helpful in those types of situations. So thank you for sharing that. Let me, let me just clarify quickly. When I said one-on-one, -on -one, I did not mean pair work. I meant okay. me working with students directly. I don't sure. use any pair work. Just, just so nobody says Walt said. <laughs> Definitely understandable. And one other thing, whenever you said, you know, I'm not a copyright lawyer, I can certainly relate because I'm also not a copyright lawyer. And we have to be so careful and mindful, especially in an online environment. We're kind of a fishbowl in a way, just because anybody can randomly show up and so-and-so's uncle is a copyright lawyer for such and such company and might notice something. So we do have to be very careful about that um, our good folks at NFLRC, I'm sure, would be able to help us out pointing us to the resource. But we do have in prior webinar series, we have done extensive work on copyright and being mindful about that. And they might be able to point all of us to a great resource. If I could maybe put you on the spot a little bit, folks, and if you can pop that into the chat, that would be appreciated. Um, and I did have a question come in that I think might be worth discussing. I, I don't want to go too deep into the rabbit hole of artificial intelligence and chat GPT, but the question came up about potentially using resources like this to create some of those texts that are maybe a little bit hard to find organically, but ChatGPT might be able to pull up in a matter of a minute or two. Have you had any experience working with anything like that? Um, I'm sorry, you're asking me or the panel? I just want to make sure. Oh, it, just panel. going back to you, uh, Walt Slauschi. Oh, okay. Um, I have tried ChatGPT. It's a very intriguing tool very interesting, but I have had no success with it in getting it to reproduce the kind of text that I want for my novice readers. These are my baby readers. It has to be 100% comprehensible to them, which means not only controlling, you know, it, 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 tightly controlling the vocabulary that's used. So chat GPT, I've actually told it, write me a story with these plot points using these words. So this was taken from a story I'd actually written as a human. 
and it couldn't do it. It kept going out of bounds on the words. So, so far, not yet, but who knows? You know, these things are developing by leaps and bounds. So who knows? It I is think a very We always have to curate them, though, with our eyes. Absolutely. It is a very interesting topic and a very interesting tool. And it's interesting to say that you are finding it's not quite there yet, which is kind of what I'm hearing from other folks, but who knows exactly as you said. Fantastic. Thank you for the insight. And uh, passing the same question now, and this would be to uh, Jin Laoshi. And the question again is, what aspects of Mandarin Chinese do you think are most challenging to teach online? Um, before answering that, can I just add a little bit on what, you know, the conversation you just had uh, with- Please Pat. do. Uh, I think I tried uh, chat GPT with kind of like same kind of thoughts. Uh, you know, this is the topic, here are the words, but I added one more thing. I said, write something for uh, grade one students. So I think, yeah, with that, actually, I think I got more, you know, I don't know, appropriate, or, but, but definitely what, when I tried it, I was uh, looking for material for my AP students. It's different from, you know, novice students. But I think what I saw, I actually, I was happy and I shared what I found from as uh, chat GPT with other AP teachers. And I think people, people think it's pretty good. We had a discussion, sorry, maybe I should save it for the last question, but we were talking about authentic materials uh, are what we want to use in our teaching, right? Is material generated by chat GPT authentic material? <laughs> and I, thought about it and, and I think I personally think it's, it is well it's close enough because I don't think when chat GPT did that did its work it had the, the idea that I'm doing this for you know second language learners right and well maybe I can it, it, it's a long you know um, it's a topic we, we, we're going to uh, dig more but I will come back to your question, Sarah, sorry. Um, my online teaching experience was primarily when we did online teaching in 2020 and 2021 school year. And I think my student um, background uh, is a little different from uh, uh, Peng Laoshi, Wang Laoshi and uh, Ke Laoshi. I'm teaching high school. So we're talking about 30 plus students in you know, like one Zoom class. And, and we're talking about teenagers who are still learning how to self, you know, uh, discipline, you know, um, keep the motivation going, keep focus, all of those. So I want to say, um, I think the most challenging aspect is how to give timely feedback. Because I think uh, for me, <laughs> on the Zoom, giving feedback to each individual student. I, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's really hard. I can, of course, ask my students to, uh, you know, pronounce or to show me this or that one by one, but it takes forever. So I think that was the one um, I struggled a lot. And <laughs> I really feel sorry because I, I feel like I didn't give them enough individual attention and yeah, and solution, <laughs> for now, I don't have a very good solution. The only thing I did was I just asked students to come to my office hour. You know, I set up, you know, certain time slots, 10 minutes for this student, then next student, next student. But definitely I miss, I know how much I miss my classroom, you know, during that year, because in a real classroom, I can just easily walk to a student, you know, I can listen to students, you know, talking simultaneously, I don't know, and I can give them feedback right away. I have heard that echoed by many people, especially during the pandemic, when folks who were not online teachers before all of a sudden became online teachers within the span of two weeks. So it was very challenging and, you know, I hats off to all of you who were in that boat, because I think 
it was tremendous the challenges that you went through, but you rose to meet it, and that is fantastic. So hats off for that. If you compare your time whenever you first started online teaching and when you were giving feedback to your students toward the end of the pandemic, when the online learning was starting to become a little bit more of a new normal for you, what do you think was different if you compare the very beginning to the very end? Do you think it went a little bit easier the more you got the practice in, or do you think you saw a lot of the same challenges? Yeah, I think I remember the date when we were told to go home, and it was just Actually, my, I, I was on campus and, you know, my principal made that announcement and immediately I could hear students were yelling. They were like happy cheering and they, 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 were, they were happy to go home and they thought they would come back right away. No, not, not you know, they stayed online for one year. And we, we, I mean, students were happy, but I think teachers were really frustrated. We didn't know what to do, especially I think for language teachers. Um, I have a colleague who is a uh, math teacher, you know, in my school, and her partner is actually my department lead. And this uh, math teacher made a comment saying that I was not aware of that, how much interaction you guys, you know, for language teachers, you guys have with your students. I think for some subjects, you can just assign, you know, a chapter to read, write a reflection, but for us, we, we just need to be there with our students every minute, right? And I think at the beginning, I had no clue what to do. But luckily, I had a group of, you know, uh, teachers, colleagues, uh, you know, with me. We always shared ideas what to do. And of course, we, we thought about asking students to record, sending their uh, recording either on our LMS or, you know, find a uh, platform like, you know, Seesaw or any uh, websites like that. But my problem is timely because, you know, if they say something which is not correct or not, not uh, accurate, I want to correct them as soon as possible. But this, you know, it just added one more layer. They recorded, we listened, then we sent feedback to them. It just, yeah, and uh, like what I mentioned earlier, at the end, of course, we figured out we could use the office hour, you know, wisely, <laughs> smartly, right? Um, but I think, yeah, that that I can say it's a big step forward, but for me, it's not a big, I mean, a step big enough to really support my students. Understandable. And again, hats off for just jumping in and being willing to meet that challenge. It was a very challenging time. And, and I think we kind of all banded together and we made it work in our own way. So thank you for that.